Hello. Hi. So, seven years ago, I did a nature walk in western Massachusetts on an orchard with a young man named Connor. He was 19, and he taught us how to make fire. And I was like, oh, that's kind of neat. OK, right? And he taught us bird calls. He did a lot of bird calls. And I was like, whoo, this guy really likes to talk to birds. OK. And then he, we were walking along the trail, and he pointed to the ground, and he said, Jay, I'm going to be back in five minutes. I want you to look at the ground and tell me what you see. So I looked at the ground, and I, all I saw was mud, pretty much. And I kept looking. I saw a bug. And I thought, maybe he's playing a trick on me. Maybe it's poop or something. I don't know. I don't see anything, and he's going to be back soon. And he came back, and I was kind of nervous, and I was a little embarrassed. And, I, and he said, what do you see? And I said, is it mud? <laughs> and he said, well, he pointed to the ground, and he made a shape. And then I saw it. It was like an animal track. I, I, I said, is it an animal track? He said, yeah, it's a deer hoof print. And I was like, I looked at that for five minutes, and I saw nothing. And now that you tell me that, I see another one and another one, and I see them everywhere. It was totally invisible before. And then on the rest of the walk, I kept seeing deer hoof prints. And, and until he opened my eyes, it was completely invisible. And so I thought to myself, what else am I not seeing that's just part of my everyday life right in front of me? What else am I not seeing? What else is completely invisible? And I could stop right there, because that's interesting enough for me to think about for the rest of my life. Um, and then a couple years later, I was in Costa Rica in a rainforest near Punta Banco um, with some natives, Guaymis, and they had this ability to do this. They would see right through leaves. They could see fibers inside of leaves, and they could take the fibers out and roll them into strings and weave bags, and they could find ones that were the right shape with the right waterproofness to build roofs out of, like a puzzle, put it together. And they saw medicine and other leaves. And I went back to Boston, where I was living, and I thought, now I have got to learn to do this. But in my modern urban environment, I've got to learn to see through concrete the way these people were seeing through the jungle. And, you know, like, what about this crack in the cement? And how does the grass grow up through the crack? Or is the grass causing the crack? What is going on? And I've got to figure this out. So I joined a dumpster diving team. And they changed the way I looked at the world, because not only did we change our language, uh, we, we started to call dumpsters urban gardens. And we didn't call ourselves dumpster divers. We called ourselves urban harvesters. And I thought, this is great. And we would go out, and we would get almonds, and fruit, and vegetables, and naked juice. And we had a biodiesel truck, and we used to get our oil reclaimed. So one place we went to was called the Middle East Restaurant. It was a restaurant. And the joke was, ah, oh, we still get our oil from the Middle East, even though we have biodiesel. So we would get our food. It was a community-supported agriculture model. That means you pay ahead of time, three bucks, we bring you a box. After we harvest, we split it up between you, and it would be enough to feed people for a week. And this blew my mind. I was like, I saw everything differently. Now I recreated my world before trash was only trash. Now trash had a meaning. It could be food. Food doesn't have to cost money. So, so I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. I have to share this with people. How did Connor do that to me? And how do other nature awareness people do this? And so I went to interview some nature awareness gurus. And I interviewed followers of Tom Brown Jr., the tracker. And then I interviewed some people from the Joseph Campbell School of Thought. Um, and one guy, he had co-founded uh, A Walk in the Woods, was the name of his company. And he told me some amazing stuff. I'm just going to play you a little clip from the phone interview I had with him. You can read about it. You can see it on TV. You can hear about it. You can be lectured about it. But when you can take a stethoscope in the spring and put it on the outer bark of a tree, and you can hear the pulse, of that sap being pulled up, the you know water being pulled up from the ground, that sap pumping up rhythmic, uh, rhythmically up until the branches so the buds unfold. It's just taking one person at a time and getting them to experience that. 
And I thought, yeah, okay, let's do it. But in the urban environment, how do I, where, what are the stethoscopes that I need and what are we going to be listening to and, and how do I do this with concrete? And so I started to look around. Who is doing nature awareness in the city? And I found a professor named Anne Spurn, an MIT professor, and she was researching this kind of re-seeing of the world at MIT with her students. And I interviewed all of her students, and they told me lots of interesting things, and one of them showed me this map that he had made. And he made this map by going around on the street, licking his finger, sticking it up, and drawing an arrow whichever direction the wind was blowing. And he went into the square, and at every point where you see an arrow, he measured the wind with his body. And in the middle there, you see a vortex. And, I, and do you want to know what was in the vortex? <laughs> Some debris. And I was like, that makes sense. And, and I was like, OK, so how can I create some kind of a camera the way they had cameras, but just for making maps of the invisible, just for a camera for the invisible? And so I started, I ran away right away. I'm a tinker and I'm a hacker. So right away, I made this prototype of temperature to color sensors. And I made four of them, and I put them everywhere in the environment. Here you see them next to a laptop. And the laptop is a hot laptop because it's running and it's in a cold room. And the one closest to it you see is red, and then there's a gradient as the, the heat field dissipates to blue at the end there. And I started looking at everything with this, and I thought, OK, how can I get a general purpose version of this so we can look at everything invisible in the urban environment? So we made this camera for the invisible, and it let you look at carbon dioxide as a color, or it let you listen to electrical resistance as a sound. You could mix and match the lender, lenses and viewfinders. And this was great. It helped people to re-see, but it didn't lead to enough action. I wanted people to repurpose. I wanted to repurpose. I wanted to take action. So we took the electrical resistance lens and the sound viewfinder and put them together as a pair. And first we made this curious caterpillar that let you listen to things in the environment. What is this electrical resistance? What is this one? And you could hear the result. And then we made it smaller. And we came up with this circuit that I called Draudio. And here's what it does. You thumb tack it into a pencil. An ordinary pencil becomes a musical pencil. You take the same circuit, you move it somewhere else, move it onto a paintbrush. Ordinary water. Any common household appliance, just attach it. The electricity is always flowing through the metal in the sink. The electricity flows right through the water in motion. Trees conduct electricity. <laughs> Put them in clothing, it becomes social. <laughs> Okay, so we put <laughs> That's my appreciation dance. So we put this circuit out in the world, and I mean put it out. We put the plans up online. We hoped people would replicate it because we hoped they'd be stoked, and they did. And now there's almost 100,000 of these circuits out in the world. People have replicated them, companies have replicated them, and they're out there, and designers are using them to create interactive puppets, and um, grad students at Stanford are using them in their user interface design class to repurpose Play-Doh, and teachers are using them in their, in their classroom uh, to teach about circuits and user interface design and creating musical instruments all at the same time. <sighs> but what I was really excited about was the way that kids were using this. Younger people used this in a way that I just didn't ever imagine. They were repurposing their facial piercings and their braces were becoming pianos. And their normal musical instruments were becoming augmented musical instruments. And in Taiwan, this young girl, she made a mushroom organ out of mushroom stems and glue and resistors and electrical tape and wires. And this boy, he made a parallel circuit out of a pineapple. And this is one young man from MIT. He made something called Stradio. It was a pun on the word Stradio. 
And this is my favorite. At not back to school camp, this 15-year-old woman, she took hula hoops that they made themselves, and she put a musical sequence on her shirt with the radio circuit, and every time that the hula hoop went around in a circle, she had created a musical looper. And she had created her whole body into a musical looper. So either on accident or on purpose, a little of both, really, we had created this situation where people could practice reseeing and repurposing and starting to recreate the world that they live in. And we thought, this is really neat with resistance in and sound out. What if we have sound in? And things, you know, that are normally just objects, they can start to be, nor that, that are just, they can have a sound. And the sound, you could build something out of the sound. And this is what we got. Here we're replicating a piano. <laughs> Everyday objects, we're inventing new musical instruments out of sneezes. Okay, so so this, we're, we're like having a lot of fun with this and we're like, okay, what if you could take the color of objects and the color could be the meaningful property and then you could use augmented reality and colors could become abstract symbols, regular everyday objects like M&Ms could be abstract symbols for computer code or musical compositions or games. And so this is what we got. Here, a regular doll becomes a game controller. Elements of nature become a platform for a computer game. And here these M&Ms stand for drum beats. Each color is a different drum sound. So here we are. We had used color, electrical resistance, sound, and people were reseeing, they're repurposing, they're recreating, and they're kind of starting to see the world in a new way, almost with a beginner's mindset, kind of the way that a baby looks at the world, but now we're all grown ups and we're seeing it that way. And so here we are, and we live in this designed world. We, you know, what, but what are the downsides? What are the downsides to living in a totally designed environment, the one we live in now? Well, um, you know, solutions are available for me on the marketplace for any problem I might have. But, you know, this, this whole paradigm was created in an era of industrial revolution, in an industrial era. So, you know, it's a beautiful moment when somebody has a wobbly table and they reach for a book or a stack of napkins to fix the wobble instead of running to Walmart. So, in a natural or nature-based environment, no human has gone around to every object and every element of the environment and said what the purpose is for each thing. But in a human-based world, all of our stuff, everything you've got that's human-designed, already has a known purpose. Or does it? This is how we're going to create a more wonderful world, by repurposing, and re to repurpose is to assign purpose, to designate meaning. And once you're assigning purpose, you're starting to see new things. And this is how, not by solving problems, but in a fit of curiosity, asking ourselves, what would be wonderful? Thank you. I want to ask Jay, um, it's interesting because when I saw his stuff and we were looking at him as a potential speaker and I went to your website and over my shoulder my eight-year-old was looking at it and had an iPad behind me and had downloaded the free app in 30 seconds <laughs> and was moving all over the house 
in like two minutes. You um, work in a lab at MIT called, I, this might be a rhetorical question, called the Lifelong Kindergarten Lab. Yes. Now, what's that about? Um, at the Lifelong Kindergarten Lab, we believe that kindergarten is working, but everything else in the formal education system is kind of broken. <laughs> <laughs> So we're like, okay, building blocks, finger paints, this is great. How can we make these for 13-year-olds, for grown-ups, for people in and out of school? What is the future of building blocks, finger paints? How can you bring sharing and imagination and iterative design and accidents into the formal and informal learning system at all ages? That's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jay. Thank you.